In this tutorial, I'll be giving an overview of the current version of Pyleth, Pyleth version 4.1. Pyleth is a modern community-driven code for coastal deformation modeling. The principal developers are myself, Brad Agard at the US Geological Survey, Matthew Nepley at the University of Buffalo, and Charles Williams at GNS Science in New Zealand. Since its beginning, we have been using modern software engineering to develop an open source community code. It has a modular design, extensive testing and documentation, and distribution to users in, by, with binary packages. Pilot version 1.0 was released in 2007. Pilot can address a range of research questions and with a focus on elasticity where the geometry does not change significantly. It is designed to handle quasi-static modeling associated with earthquakes, answering questions related to strain accumulation associated with interseismic deformation, co-seismic stress changes and fault slip, and post-seismic relaxation of the crust. Pilot is also designed for dynamic modeling associated with earthquakes, including modeling of strong ground motions, co-seismic stress changes and fault slip, and earthquake rupture behavior. We are still working to incorporate these dynamic modeling features in our latest multi-physics formulation. But it can also be used to model volcanic deformation associated with magma reservoirs and or dikes, answering questions related to inflation, deformation occurring during eruptions, and dike intrusions. We have been developing and maintaining Pyleth for nearly 20 years. The code has undergone major uh, overhauls and more are planned. We have made changes to the underlying data structures, changes to the mathematical form formulation. We have migrated from Python 2 to Python 3. We've changed uh, C++ test frameworks. The hardware has also evolved over these times. When we started, most op computers were running 32-bit operating systems. Macintosh computers were using PowerPC chips, which were 32-bit, which then migrated to Intel chips, and now we have ARM processors. Similarly, Linux has migrated from 32-bit i686 to 64-bit x86-64 architecture. Software development has also changed. When CIG started, it hosted its own subversion repository. Now we use cloud-based GitHub repositories uh, that are accessed via Git. We did primarily development on a single branch. Now we use a Git forking workflow that is much more uh, flexible and easy to manage multiple developers. When we started, there were very few, few uh, centralized systems for automated testing. So CIG had hosted their own system. Now we use the cloud-based Azure pipelines with automated testing workflows in the cloud. We are doing most of our text editing uh, of the code using just simple text editors like Emacs. Now we use uh, integrated development environments such as VS Code. User support has also changed. Originally, Pilot was built from source um, and every user had to build the, the code on their own computer. Now we provide binary packages, Docker containers for development. Uh, the manual was uh, generated using LaTeX to create a PDF file. Now we use uh, Markdown and Sphinx to produce an online uh, electronic publications as well as PDF versions of the manual. Interaction with users was done almost exclusively through a main list, and now we have a searchable online form. Pilot version three was a major rewrite that took nearly six years. And we migrated from governing equations that were hardwired with elasticity to now flexible specifications of boundary conditions. Uh, we have elasticity, incompressible elasticity, and poor elasticity. We had a single uh, temporal discretization for quasi-static problems using backward Euler and the Newmark central difference method for dynamic problems. Now we use the Petzi time-stepping algorithms uh, with uh, working towards uh, using higher order Runge kana methods. Our spatial discretization in pilot version two is hardwired to first order. Now it's flexible and we've tested up to fourth order. And we uh, primarily do testing at uh, basis orders of uh, first and second order. The finite element definition and all of those routines 
in Pyloth version two were actually in the Pyloth code itself. Now, uh, with most of those routines and uh, have been migrated to Petsy, and so we rely heavily on Petsy to define our finite elements as well as do uh, a lot of our finite element integrations. There have been relatively few changes from Pyloth version three to the current version of Pyloth version 4.1. Version 4.0 is very similar to version 3.0. There were a few very small changes to parameter files, mainly related to faults. In version 4.1, we've added a visualization utility, new examples, um, some substantial performance improvements, and quite a few bug fixes. Starting with Pilot version 3, we are following semantic versioning guidelines more closely. And this means that the version numbers convey the impact on users um, and not necessarily the amount of change to the code. Whereas previously, when we had a major version release, that meant a lot of changes to the code, um, as well as changes to the users. But now, when we do a major release, it means there are changes to the inter user interface that, break that breaks backward compatibility. That means that you will need to update your parameter files to be able to use a new version. If we do a minor release, there are new features and bug fixers bug fixes, but the parameter files are all backward compatible. In a patch release, it means there are no new features and we're just making bug fixes. For the version 4.1, we have contributors that include the primary developers, as well as Daniel Douglas, who is a USGS NSF intern, Evan Marskal and Zhejiao uh, um, Zhu from the two, 2023 hackathon who have contributed examples. In Pilot version 4.1, most features from version 2.2 have been re-implemented, tested, and documented. There are a few additional features and under the hood improvements that are almost ready. This includes the elasticity with inertia and prescribed fault slip for dynamic problems, as well as, all as, well as parallel mesh loading. And those will be available in the next major release. A few major features in version 2.2 that have not yet been implemented are the spontaneous fault rupture, that's the fault friction, as well as the small strain formulation for elasticity. Now I'm going to discuss, give an overview of the major features of Pilot version 4.1. We have governing equations in terms of elasticity with static and quasi-static problems. Dynamic problems with inertia are in progress. Infinitesimal strains are available. The small strain formulation is in progress. We have gravitational body forces as well as just general body forces throughout the domain. We have bulk rheologies. That's the constitutive models for elasticity. We have isotropic linear elasticity, isotropic linear Maxwell viscoelasticity, viscoelasticity, viscoelasticity isotropic linearized generalized Maxwell viscoelasticity, isotropic parallel viscoelasticity, and the isotropic drucker pager elastoplasticity is in progress. We have incompressible elasticity for static and quasi-static problems with infinitesimal strains, gravitational body forces, uh, general body forces, and a single rheology that is the isotropic linear elasticity. For poor elasticity, we support static and quasi-static problems with infinitesimal strains, gravitational body forces, as well as general body forces. Uh, bulk rheologies is still is uh, just the isotropic linear elasticity. We can do prescribed slip without poor elastic coupling across the fault. Um, and then the prescribed slip with poor elastic fault properties is in progress. Our boundary conditions, we have simple time-dependent Dirichlet boundary conditions and Neumann boundary conditions of their tractions. Uh, we have absorbing boundary conditions. And uh, we are working towards more complex specification of spatial and temporal variations on the boundary uh, to support complex loading. We have interface conditions. That's the faults for kinematic prescribed slip. You can have multiple ruptures and multiple faults. We uh, are working on uh, dynamic fault interfaces for static friction, linear slip weakening, possibly linear time weakening, and Dittrich Wiener rate and state friction. In uh, other general features, we can import meshes from GMesh and Qubit using the Exodus 2 file format. We can uh, import meshes using simple ASCII files. 
Those are intended for toy problems only and not uh, larger meshes. We have initial, you can specify initial conditions. We can output to HDF5 and VTK files for the solution over the domain, the solution over a boundary of the domain, solution interpolated to user specified points such as GPS or seismic stations or other arbitrary points of interest, solutions uh, over materials and boundary conditions, state variables such, and, such as stress and strain within each material, and uh, fault information such as the slip and change in tractions. Pilot does an automatic conversion of units for all parameters. It has parallel uniform global refinement, which we will demonstrate in upcoming uh, examples within this workshop. Uh, we also have Petsley linear and nonlinear solvers. Pilot provides a uh, output of the simulation, pro simulation progress with estimates at, that estimates the overall runtime and tells you how what percentage is complete. And uh, we have default Petsy options that are based on the, on the material, that's the governing equation, to select uh, suitable solvers. I'm now going to cover the governing equations. I'll focus on elasticity, but we also have incompressible elasticity and poor elasticity available, and refer to the governing equations section of the pilot manual for more detail. Before I get into the governing equations, I want to briefly discuss the fine element method. For the discretization, we divide a main into cells. In 2D, that's triangles or quadrilaterals. In 3D, it's tetrahedra and hexahedra. We represent a field, such as our solution field, which may be, which is generally the displacement or elasticity within each cell using basis functions. We often use polynomials, but we can use other types of functions too. Uh, and there are uh, specific strategies for choosing uh, what those polynomials look like and how they're implemented. And these are covered in most fine element textbooks. To give you an example of what, are, what we mean by basis functions, a basis order of zero is just a constant uh, value within a cell. Uh, this is similar to a, a finite difference method. Uh, a basis order of one um, has a linear variation within the cell. A basis order of two has a quadratic variation. Well, and you can see as we increase the basis order, we have more complex variation of the field within the cell, as well as uh, we have more coefficients, which uh, makes sense. In 2D, uh, we have a basis order of, of zero is still just a uniform value within the cell. A basis order of one is linear in X and Y. A basis order of two in the most general case has linear terms as well as quadratic terms and cross terms. Uh, some basis functions for basis order two may drop uh, one uh, of of those functions. Um, and uh, so you may have some of the quadratic terms, but not necessarily all of them. And then we compute the integral as a sum and evaluation of functionals at points. We choose the point locations to minimize the errors in the integrals for given basis functions. And this looks like we approximate an integral by a sum over cells that are weighted by evaluating uh, functions uh, with the basis functions evaluated at those points. And this is covered in uh, most fine element textbooks. In uh, implementing the fine element uh, method for our case, we are solving the governing equation in an integrated sense. We multiply our partial differential equation by a trial function and integrate over the domain. And we want to minimize the error uh, associated with respect to the unknown coefficients so that we set that integral equal to zero. This leads to equations of the form where we have a trial function dotted with some function uh, and then the gradient in the trial function also dotted with, an, with another function uh, integrated over the domain and set that equal to zero. In general, we want to solve equations in which the weak form can be expressed, expressed as some function of time, the solution field, the time derivative of the solution field equals another function that's a function of just time and the solution field, no time derivatives on the right-hand side, and we have initial conditions. F and G are vector functions, T is time, and S is a solution vector. Using the final method and the divergence theorem, we cast the weak form 
into what is shown down below, which is what I showed on the previous slide. F0 and G0 are vectors, F1 and G1 are tensors. So let's see how this looks for elasticity with pres prescribed slip, uh, where we're going to use implicit time stepping without inertia. Our solution field has the displacement as well as a Lagrange multiplier corresponding to the change in fractions on the fault. And I'll get into what this means uh, in, uh, at the bottom of the slide. We have our elasticity equation of body forces um, with the uh, divergence of the stress equal to zero. We have uh, the normal tractions on uh, the boundaries. We have uh, displacement boundary conditions on uh, other boundaries. And then we want to enforce fault slip across uh, the fault surface. So we have the jump in displacement. That's displacement on the, what we call the positive side minus the displacement on the negative side is equal to the specified slip. Uh, on that fault interface, uh, we have the tractions, uh, which is really the change in tractions is equal to minus the Lagrange multiplier on the positive side of the fault face and the positive Lagrange multiplier on the negative side of the fault face. And this is a domain decomposition approach to introducing dislocations uh, into our mesh. And we covered that in our 2013 JGR paper extensively. We create the weak form by taking the dot product with our trial function. Uh, we have a trial function for each solution field and integrating over the domain. So here is our governing equation uh, in terms of our, our main uh, PDE in terms of the volume. Then we have our boundary conditions over our traction or our Neumann boundary conditions, our fault surface, um, as well as our uh, Lagrange multiplier equation where we enforce um, the constraint that we want the jump in displacements equal to the slip. We can rewrite all of these and identify uh, our f and g functions. So on the left-hand side, uh, we have all of our uh, physics. And on the right-hand side, for implicit time stepping uh, with compatible with our Pepsi solvers, we set those terms are zero. So we moved everything to left-hand side. We have a function here for our body forces our stresses within the material, our tractions on the boundary, and then our jump and displacements. And within Pilot, we implement all these F0 and F1 functions. Petsy implements and performs the integration of uh, those functions dotted into the trial functions or double contracted with the gradient in the trial function um, and performs the integration and does the solve. So in terms of implementing the physics, all we have to worry about are these kernels or pointwise functions uh, that are used to implement the governing equation. The nice thing is these functions are very simple to construct. Our body forces is just a vector uh, that's the dimension at each point. And we implement these at point locations. We don't have to worry about how many times these are evaluated in space. Um, and so we compute our stresses. We have our Lagrange multipliers, which are just part of the solution field. Very easy to compute. We have our displacements as well as our slip. So whenever we specify the slip, we can easily specify each of those terms uh, in our function, given that we have um, as a parameter incoming the solution field. To solve these, we also have to compute the Jacobians, which are the derivative of those functions with respect to our solution fields uh, or our velocities. Uh, if we have velocities and um, this gives us in our system Jacobians, the elasticity um, uh, coefficients, the CI, in this case, we write it instead of CIJKL, it's CIKJL, and that's consistent with how we are formulating uh, the Jacobian with respect to our trial and basis functions. Um, but the main thing to know is that if you're familiar with elasticity, this is the stiffness matrix. Uh, we also have terms associated with our our fault and its orientation. Generally, these are ones and zeros, but they're uh, in the more general aspect, they're the direction cosines associated with the orientation of the fault, um, but very easy to uh, set those up. This results in a Jacobian as a structure that looks like this, where we have our stiffness matrix in the upper 
left side, and then we have our fault orientation terms uh, with a zero on the diagonal. Um, so you'll notice that uh, with a zero on the diagonal, it creates a little more complexity in solving because we don't want to uh, generally deal with zeros on the diagonal uh, in our solve. And so we've come up with various strategies for solving this. Uh, in pilot version three, we use the sure complement. Now we are using a variable point block Jacobi that solves this system very efficiently uh, and scales very well with problem size. And by that, I mean the number of iterations does not increase significantly, even as you scale the problem size by factors of two, four, eight, and even 16. So how does this final implementation affect the user interface? The pointwise functions for the residuals in Jacobian are selected automatically based on the material and your boundary conditions. Uh, fields and subfields, uh, the final coefficients for the basis functions, that's the values at vertices, edges, faces, or cells, are stored in, in, a, in what is called a field. A field is composed of a section which associates the points with final element coefficients and a vector, which has all the, the real uh, or floating point values for the final element coefficients. So we have both uh, an index that tells us what value within an array of floating point values corresponds to which point or edge, cell, or, or face. Uh, and then we can build up a field with multiple uh, uh, subfields or uh, in this case, like for the elasticity with a fault, we have both the displacement field as well as the Lagrange multiplier and poor elasticity. We have things like fluid pressure. And so a field may hold one or more subfields. Um, we also store material properties in a field. So it has may have fields like density, shear modulus, bulk modulus for an isotropic linear elastic material. In terms of the discretization, each subfield within a field can have a different discretization or basis order. Uh, the default basis order is one. So if you don't set the basis order for a solution, it'll have a linear variation within the cell. Um, as well as when you specify material properties, they'll have linear variations within the cell, or it'll be set up to handle that even if you have uniform material properties. So in order to read, because a basis order of one requires storing more values, if we do have uniform fields, such as uniform material properties, we use a basis order of zero to reduce the storage requirements. For the solution field, uh, the subfields match the unknowns in the governing equation. So if we have just elasticity without any faults, we have displacement. If we have a fault, we have displacement and the Lagrange multiplier. As I've mentioned, it contains all the final coefficients corresponding to the solution of the problem. And you can output any subfield over the domain and external bounding or specified locations in the domain. Um, I should point out that the Lagrange multiplier is defined just over the fault surface, whereas displacement is defined over the, over the whole domain. So for uh, on the domain and external boundaries, you can output displacement. On the fault surface, you can output slip as well as the change in tractions, or you can request the Lagrange multiplier. Um, but it does, the Lagrange multiplier corresponds directly to the change in tractions. The auxiliary fields are, we use to specify spatially variable parameters for materials, boundary conditions, fault interfaces. Each parameter, uh, whether it's a scalar, vector, or tensor, is held on a separate subfield. We also use auxiliary fields to hold the state variables. Um, and any subfield can be output after initialization, as in the terms of the diagnostics, or after solving uh, the governing equations. So you can output your material properties. Well, the material properties are output automatically um, after your pilot performs the initialization, and then uh, things like state variables are automatically output uh, during the solve. This is a diagram of the general workflow for running a crustal deformation modeling problem. Um, and uh, this is generally within the context of what we think for Pyleth. You need to develop some sort of model of your geologic structure. You can use a variety of tools. Um, this is not explicitly required. Generally, you do uh, need to um, input your geologic structure into mesh generation. We primarily use the GMesh 
um, as well as have support for Qubit. Uh, Qubit uh, is available to non-US federal government users uh, and requires a license. It is free to federal government users. Gmesh is open source. Um, you may use open source tools such as Open Cascade that can create the geometry that you would bring in. Uh, there are people that uh, want to develop very complicated models, so they may use a commercial tool uh, that's used to model geologic structure like GoCAD or EarthVision to bring those models um, into Qubit um, or potentially also GMesh as well. For our physics code, CIG has uh, two main codes, uh, pilots, which we'll be discussing at this workshop. Sylvain Barbeau has a relaxed code um, that has uh, handles much simpler geometries and not as much physics. Um, and then you can also use commercial fine element packages such as Abacus to do similar types of calculations. For visualization, there are a lot of scientific visualization tools. With Pyleth version 4, we have developed uh, a utility called Pyleth Viz that works directly with Pyleth output, and it's built on, on top of PyVista, which is a general scientific visualization tool. You can also use graphical user interfaces, such as ParaView and Visit, uh, Python scripting tools, such as Matplotlib, um, as well as GMT. The general workflow within Pyleth is we have our mesh generation, whether we're getting a qubit mesh, gmesh, or text editor, they all write a mesh file that is read into by Pyleth. We have specify our simulation parameters separately. Generally, we develop those using some sort of text editor. Um, pick whatever one you like to work with, but uh, there are some, uh, the more sophisticated text editors and uh, coding software such as VS Code, uh, work very well, and you can generate your parameter files directly in those text editors. Uh, for spatial databases, for very simple ones, we'll create these just by writing them out by hand, um, but there are also uh, tools, um, uh, scripts and tools within Pyleth for providing values that then uh, you can ask uh, via Python, uh, do a function call, and it'll dump those values out in the right format. Um, for that particular spatial database. When Pyleth runs, it produced either VTK files, these are legacy files. Um, those are no longer the default as of version three. In version three, we're writing HDF5 files. Uh, those have a specific structure um, and, uh, and storage scheme. Um, and for visualization package to understand and find, uh, what data they need in terms of the topology of the domain and the, and the solution points or other fields it wants to plot. We need XDMF files um, that those have a very specific structure and follow standards. Um, and those files uh, are, are what you load into visit and pair view. Pyleth reads the HDF file, uh, Pyleth viz reads the HDF files directly. Um, PyVista can read the XDMF files. Um, but uh, Pyleth Viz works directly with the HDF5 files. It knows, because it's developed with Pyleth, it knows to lay out those files, and we don't need um, the XDMF files, um, which is a nice feature. Uh, in post-processing, we do uh, Python scripting with a tool called H5Py that can read the HDF files directly. Uh, MATLAB can also read HDF files, so if you want to look at the values um, and do your plot in MATLAB, you can do that as well. These are what fine element meshes look like. On the left-hand side, we've taken uh, an unstructured uh, quadrilateral approach for doing this meshing with finer discretization near, uh, these are reverse faults with a splay fault, uh, and then coarsen the mesh with distance from the fault. We also have uh, over here on the right, a 3D subduction zone that's meshed uh, with tetrahedral cells with a uniform uh, spatial discretization. Let's get in a little more detail in terms of uh, the fault interface. Uh, this is how we uh, decompose the domain in Pyleth. We have a fault surface I've shown here as a slight opening, but this is uh, just to an exaggerated view. There's uh, no opening across the fault, uh, but we do have a normal and we have a discretization for the positive side as well as the negative side, a jump in displacement across the fault and equal and opposite tractions. Uh, shear tractions across the fault. 
If we have our original mesh for our mesh generator, when Pilot runs, it first identifies where the fault is and any end vertices. It then splits the mesh, adding co-located points on the positive side of the fault. And so we have our original vertex on the left side shown in blue. We have our new verte vertices on the right-hand side. At the end of the fault, where it ends in the middle of the mesh, it does not split. And this forces the slip to be zero at that end. We then uh, add new cells on the right-hand side, uh, shown uh, as the, uh, sorry, we don't add new cells. We uh, take those cells on the right-hand side and update the vertices that have been added into those cells. Um, and then uh, we do create new cells along this interface, and these are called cohesive cells. There are zero volume, zero area cells, um, and they control all of the physics for the fault uh, surface. And we encapsulate all the physics of the fault uh, with those uh, cells. And so the cells on the, on the adjacent to the boundary don't need to know anything about the fault uh, to perform those integration, and that really provides a modular design um, and makes it easy uh, to generate bulk constitutive models as well as separate uh, models for the faulting. And finally, we update the overall um, mesh in the surrounding cells that account for the changes in the vertices along the fault. Uh, this is described in our 2013 JGR paper, um, and that has not changed as we've gone to uh, version four. In Pilot, we focus on the geodynamics and leverage packages developed by computational scientists. Pilot, uh, the main packages Pilot uses is PETSI for all of our linear algebra and final element uh, routines. We use a package called Spatial Database, Spatial Data that I wrote that has um, the spatial variation, the parameters over our boundary conditions as well as within the domain. It's a generalized interface. We use uh, things like the Proj projection library to handle georeferencing. We have a power, we use leverage the Pyre simulation framework, and we use lower level Python modules such as NumPy um, for uh, incorporating values um, and uh, low level array operations in Python. Petsy uh, is, will handles most of our interfaces with HDF5. We read uh, qubit meshes using net, the NetCDF library. Um, and Petsy uses lower level packages such as BLAST and LAPAC for linear algebra operations. And uh, we also have a reliance on MPI for message passing interface uh, for parallel processing. And so the solvers use the parallel processing, rewrite uh, to file our HDF files in parallel as well as our power simulation framework knows how to set up uh, jobs to run on various queue systems. When you think of Pyleth and uh, the simulation parameters, you should think of a hierarchy of components. Each component has um, the user input, which is going into properties and facilities. Properties are things like scalar values, facilities, or other objects. We have then have an interface that allows us to call C++ routines from Python. Um, not every component has a C++ uh, uh, inter, um, functions that are, some uh, components are just in Python. Uh, we also have low level functions that are just in the C++. But generally we are gathering all user input from Python that gets all passed to C++. And then we run and this, all of the real computation is done at the lower level. And one of the reasons why we use Python is that it has dynamic uh, typing, which permits adding new modules at runtime. So it gives us very flexible um, modularity um, and uh, it would gives the potential for allowing a user to actually add new features without uh, modifying any of the original code. So there's no one in our code that says the, where there's a big if statement that says, oh, if the user wants this property, then add this component um, to it. It's it's done on the fly and it, using the Pyre framework to build the, com assemble the components into a hierarchy and set the parameters for our simulation. Um, some additional words about uh, how we set up simulations. Uh, the defaults, 
values, which are used extensively, target quasi-static elasticity. So the default problem type is a time-dependent problem that solves the elasticity equation with a linear isotropic elastic bulk rheology um, using uh, Dirichlet or, or displacement boundary conditions. The general defaults for things like specifying boundary conditions is it's going to use a simple DB spatial database. That's a text file um, that has arbitrary uh, sort of points uh, in terms of if you have very structured grid, then you want to use the simple grid database that is much more efficient. Uh, our output by default is written to HDF5 files. Um, and uh, you can select alternative components at runtime. And that's basically a lot of what we're doing uh, when we're setting up our parameter files. Uh, there's a very simple syntax for specifying parameters for properties and components. The syntax is we have uh, a top level application context. And then we walk down the hierarchy by specifying a component, subcomponent, sub subcomponent, and so forth. A component, you just specify uh, the name of the component and then uh, the object that you want to use for that component. A parameter is just, you know, parameter equals value. So an example of this is here we have our problem. We have boundary conditions. In this case, we're going to specify a boundary condition on the negative x boundary as well as a positive x boundary. So we create an array of two boundary conditions. We can have any number of boundary conditions. Um, and here we're specifying the type that it's a Dirichlet time-dependent boundary conditions for each of those. These are the default boundary condition types. So we wouldn't have to do that. If we had a if we wanted to change it to a Neumann time-dependent boundary condition, we would have to specify and change to change the default, you do something like this, where you specify the name of the component you want to change and then uh, the specific uh, na full name of the component um, to attach to that new com um, to that specific component. Uh, for uh, specific um, parameters for our boundary condition, if we're going to constrain a particular degree of freedom, uh, the x degree of freedom is degree of freedom zero, the y degree of freedom is one, z degree of freedom is two. So here on the positive x boundary, we're going to constrain the x uh, bound, uh, X component of the displacement field. Uh, we need to give it the marker in our mesh file of what boundary uh, is associated with our this particular boundary condition. So our marker is boundary underscore X pause. We then need to specify the parameters for that boundary condition. In this case, we, can, we just specify it directly in our parameter file using a uniform spatial database. We give it a description. We tell it what values uh, it needs in terms of setting up an initial amplitude for our time-dependent boundary condition um, that are held fixed with time. In this case, we're doing, uh, we give it both components of the, of the amplitude, uh, even though we're only constraining uh, the X component. And that's because we're looking for a vector uh, value in our Dirichlet boundary condition. There are a variety of spatial databases that are available. Um, you can use a, uh, if you have a uniform value, you can just give a, a dirt for like a Dirichlet boundary condition. That is um, what we call a, a zero D boundary condition because the dimension is zero. You can specify piecewise linear variation and tractions for a Neumann or variation displacement for a Dirichlet boundary condition. That would be a 1D uh, spatial dimension or sorry, data dimension. The distribution of a fault slip can specify it in 2D, 3D uh, material properties from, say, a seismic velocity model, that would be 3D. The advantages of spatial databases that they are generally independent of the discretization for the problem. So we're separating how you're specifying the boundary conditions from the discretization. So you can update your boundary conditions without changing your mesh. You can update your mesh without changing how you specify your boundary conditions. There are a variety of different spatial databases types that are available. We have an analytical functional form called an analytic DB, um, where you in your directly in your parameter file, you specify the functional form um, and it'll get applied uh, to specifying your boundary condition. Uh, a uniform DB is optimized for a uniform value, so you can specify it also directly within a parameter file. 
Our simple database is for generally for arbitrarily distributed points for variations in 0D, 1D, 2D, and 3D. For example, you can specify uh, points along a line that are unequally spaced uh, for a 1D spatial variation. Um, and uh, Pyloth will do a pointwise linear interpolation uh, to create uh, the apply set values for like a boundary condition or material properties. You can have 2D where the points don't conform to a grid. You may have them scattered about from some other data, or it may just be simpler to specify arbitrarily um, points and distributed in space. Same thing with 3D. We don't recommend simple spatial database, the simple DB type for 3D because it becomes very slow to find those points. Um, generally, if we're going to do uh, more complex spatial variations in the parameters, we're going to use a simple grid DB. Um, and there we have logically gridded points. Uh, they don't uh, necessarily have to be equal space, but they do have to conform to a logical grid. And those can be in 1D, 2D, and 3D. And that way we can very efficiently find the points, do perform the interpolation, um, and uh, they're quite efficient. We have a special case for a uniform DB with zero values. That's like zero displacements um, on a boundary. Um, and uh, that's the zero DB spatial database type. The documentation for Pilot is now uh, mostly online. That's sort of our preferred interface. You can download an electronic pub file or a PDF file if you want to browse through those. The advantage of the online documentation is you have a navigation panel that allows you to walk through and easily navigate. It has search capabilities um, that make it very easy to search through the documentation um, as well. Uh, the installer uh, is available online. That's only if you are building from source for things like on, on a cluster. The spatial database documentation has its own um, uh, manual that's available at spatialdata.readthedocs.io. Um, navigating through the pilot manual, the introduction covers things like conventions uh, that we use in the typesetting, uh, release notes, the development plan. Um, then there is a user guide section that gives information about what's new in Pilot version 3 and 4, a history, the overall Pilot workflow, the architecture, how to get help and report bugs. The running Pilot section goes over how to de defining the simulation, the Pilot application, the options, how to specify the final mesh, all the different utilities, as well as a troubleshooting section. In the, um, in the Pilot component section, that's where we give the detailed specifications of all the different components within Pyloth, what their parameters value are, what the default values are, as well as examples of setting parameters. And that Pyloth component section is generated automatically um, from, the, the, from the source code. So that keeps it up to date. The developer guide, uh, we also have the example section, um, which is pretty obvious. Um, and within the developer section, we have information from about how to contribute to Pilot. We go over our coding style, our Git workflow, the layout of the code, the Petsy final implementation, um, particularly the nomenclature. We have a brief section going over what you need to do to add new governing equations or bulk rheologies, uh, documentation on how to rebuild Petsy and Pilot if you're doing development, and how we do our testing and debugging using testing, as well as a section on contributing to the documentation. The utilities that uh, Pilot includes, there's the new Pilot Biz utility for plotting information in the HDF5 files that are output from Pilot. There is a uh, utility called PyreDoc for displaying the Pyre properties and facilities that are available for a given component. If you include uh, extensive metadata in your parameter files, you can use the Pilot CFG search utility to search and display that metadata. So if you are, have a big research project and you have a bunch of parameter files and you've uh, set up the metadata to provide keywords, features you wanna look for, um, you can keep track of those things um, in terms of using the CFG search utility. Uh, we use the Pilot Run utility to run simulations and verify that our examples are working 
Um, it basically just runs, looks through a directory and finds all the parameter files that uh, it thinks it can run and it tries to run them. The pilot dump parameters is a utility that uh, you can use to uh, dump parameters for a, a set of CFG files. So as long as the parameters validate, it can dump out um, what those parameters are. It divide, dumps out a JSON file that you can load into our um, parameter viewer that's either online or you can run on your local machine uh, to view the hierarchy of parameters and, and also get help information. There is a utility called Pilot EQ Info for computing earthquake rupture statistics. For example, um, it'll compute moment magnitude, the seismic moment, average slip from, directly from the pilot output files. Um, and if you do post-processing and change the HDF5 files, as long as they continue to correspond to the layout written by Pyleth, you can re regenerate the corresponding XDMF files using our, the Pilot underscore gen XDMF uh, utility. This is what that parameter uh, viewer looks like. Um, this is running on a local machine, so you can scroll up and down the hierarchy of parameters, and you can look at uh, specific values. It gives you information about what properties can be set, what facilities or subcomponents can be set, uh, what default values are, what the type is, um, as well as uh, a description. And we'll cover this in uh, our um, examples. So in terms of getting started, we suggest reading the user guide sections of the pilot manual. Um, when you run pilot, don't ignore warnings and error messages. Uh, and we'll have a, there's a troubleshooting uh, section of this tutorial that will go over how to uh, understand those error messages and warnings and strategies for troubleshooting. Uh, as you move forward, we ex recommend using an example uh, as a starting point. And if you do need help, um, in general, we use the Pilot community forum that's dedicated to Pilot. It's available on community.geodynamics.org. And there uh, is also the users tab on the public web page with uh, resources to, in terms of uh, uh, tutorials and previous con uh, workshop content um, that uh, you can make uh, use of in terms of um, getting help and uh, learning about how to run Pilot. So creating a simulation, we recommend start by creating a diagram of the boundary value problem that you want to solve. Then you'll uh, generate the final mesh. You want to create a diagram of your geometry, then create the geometry. You mark the boundaries in Gmesh before you generate the mesh. In Qubit, you do it after you generate the mesh. Um, and at the end, after you've generated your mesh, you want to make sure you check the mesh quality. You want to make sure you don't have any severely distorted cells. Um, that are really going to um, affect the performance of how Pilot uh, can perform its solve. Creating the parameter files, uh, you select the governing equation or material. You set the solution field based on the governing equation. Um, if you're solving elasticity, then those first two are handled for you. Um, you if you need to adjust the basis order of the solution, you want to look at what you're uh, what you expect your solution field to, how it varies in space. Is it smooth? Does it have strong, sharp gradients that need to be resolved? Uh, in the parameter file, you choose your output, you set your material prop, uh, rheologies, you set your faults and, and ruptures, the boundary conditions, um, particularly for any auxiliary fields, you want to set the basis order so it, uh, it captures the spatial variation. And you, we highly recommend setting that metadata rather than just copying and pasting what's available. Um, after you have your parameter files, then you create your spatial database files. You need to think about, well, am I specifying a uniform value? Does it have a linear variation along a single dimension? Does it have some 2D variation? Um, and that's the data dimension. Or does it vary in 3D space? And that'd be a data dimension of three. You also need to select uh, based on what your grid looks or spatial variation looks like, which type of spatial database to use. If you have an analytical function, then use the analytical database. Make your life easy. If it's a uniform value, just use the uniform DB. Uh, irregular point distribution, use the simple DB. 
and then use a simple grid DB if you have logical grid that's aligned with the coordinate axes. Our general tips is to start simple, uh, start with 2D, simplify the geometry, coarse mesh, static simulation with prescribed slip, and then increase the complexity in steps, add time dependence, the mesh increase the mesh resolution where you need it, uh, then transition to 3D and perhaps increase the resolution of geometry if necessary. So first steps, we suggest you don't edit the examples in the binary distribution. Copy all those examples over to some other directory so that you can refer back to the original examples um, and that what they look like because you might make mistakes and you want to maybe restart or you want to start over from a, a different example or the same example and, and make different changes. So copy those files over a different directory. Work through some relevant examples. Uh, at the end of each example, we list some exercises in the manual, and we recommend that those are sort of uh, simple things you can do that'll help you understand how Pilot Look works. Um, and then once you're comfortable starting to modify examples, then try building up one uh, that looks like your problem of interest. And that completes uh, this presentation.